the blood clot issue has made headlines uh, in the past weeks. So, but based on what we know now and the research that's being done, how big are the blood clot risks of the AstraZeneca jab? Yeah, I think, you know, really, really important for us uh, first to recognize um, is number one, there is a link. Um, but the link is very, or very, very rare. And number three, a causal link, right? Just because it's linked, a causal link has not been established. And what is certainly universally accepted is the benefits of the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, still outweighs the risk. So let's look at the link first, right? And I think a couple of European countries, um, you know, started uh, alerting, uh, you know, these blood clots. And only recently, uh, after going through and seeing the data, the European Union and the United Kingdom regulators reported that this link uh, is there, but it's really rare. That this unusual blood clots um, and the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. But as I mentioned, the link is really rare. And I, I really mean this, the operative word is that it's extremely rare. And that is why it was perhaps not found in the initial um, clinical trials. To put this into context, huh? after 20 million people have been vaccinated with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, only 79 cases of these rare blood clots with low platelets or thrombocytopenia um, have, and, and only 19 deaths have been recorded. So this equates to about one blood clot case per 250,000 people that are vaccinated so when you talk about percentage, it's 0 0.00004, uh, maybe just 304, 0.0004%, and one death in a million. And, and I think this is why it's very important. I think we have become really hypersensitive with this risk against vaccines. Talking about blood clots, although the nature of the blood clots differ, one in 2,000 women each year will develop blood clots from taking the combined oral contraceptive pill. And also, although many of us don't have this risk recently, but one in 1,000 people a year will develop a blood clot from air travel. So it's really important to recognize how rare it is. Also, really important to recognize that the causal link has not been established. So scientists are really working very hard to understand why is it that these blood clots um, are, are, are happening uh, in these very isolated cases. But today, the exact, exact mechanism is poorly understood. And although it was noted that many of the cases were women under 60, because the numbers are so low, no risk factors, be it gender, age, have also been established. But I want to again impress upon that the benefit outweighs the risk. What is really very clear is that through the various agencies, including the European Medicines Agency, they have concluded that the reported you know, incidence of these blood clots are so rare and the overall benefits of the vaccine in preventing COVID-19 way outweighs the risk of side effects, especially when you think about how even within a few weeks that I mentioned, more than 6,000 deaths in the UK were prevented for people, you know, age 70 and older. That essentially, because a single dose of the shot also reduced the risk of hospitalization from COVID-19 by more than 80% in, in certain age groups, and up to 73% protection against the symptomatic disease. It's important to recognize that the risk is so much smaller than the benefit. But whatever it is, we know that this discussion has obviously shifted the public perception from everyone a few months ago, here, yeah, I don't want mRNA vaccine. I don't want mRNA to go into me. You know, I want the Oxford vaccine, right? The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. You know, uh, now the, the, it's shifted. And that is why, you know, for example, the NPRA 
uh, at the moment and the government of Malaysia is really you know, going in, in deep uh, analysis of the data. As you know, many of the regulators, when they make decisions, like I said, it's not just the data, it's also public perception, because we know how public perception is also going to affect vaccine hesitancy. And yep. so that is why, you know, you have seen many of the European countries, you know, who now choose uh, to, to set a certain age group. So the 55s and the 60 year olds and the UK recently announced that the um, vaccine, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine will be used for the above 30s. Um, even though there's no established, you know, uh, strong factor as yet. But that's what the, the government of Malaysia is currently doing rigorously evaluating the data as well as the public sentiment before a decision needs to be made. For me, all right, uh, I think that it should continue to be part of our strategic and targeted immunization rollout because um, it, it, you know, looking at the benefits and looking at how having various different vaccines as part of our national immunization rollout has got its benefits. But even if ultimately the government of Malaysia chooses not to, mostly because of its impact on public perception. The great thing is that this will not have a significant impact on vaccine availability for us. Because as you know, Malaysia had the foresight to diversify its supply of vaccines. And this was the reason why you know, it invested in securing from different distributors, because you could never know, right? Um, and, and I think for me at this juncture, um, it is so important to remind yourself that while there is a link, the link is so rare um, that you know the causal link itself hasn't been established, and the benefit of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine across the different clinical trials, across the real world data, and because it has been used to vaccinate millions and millions of people, the benefits are so so compelling.